And welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Combining Optical Brain Imaging and Physiological Signals to Study Cognitive Function. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Biopack Systems and FNIR Devices and we'll review how researchers can integrate the study of cognitive process with physiological signals in both stationary laboratory-based studies and real-world mobile applications. First, we will be joined by Dr. Hassan Ayaz, Associate Research Professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering, Science and Health Systems at Drexel University. Dr. Ayaz's research interests include neuroengineering and human-computer interaction and neuroergonomics, as well as clinical and field applications of optical brain imaging. Today, he will present the physiological and physical principles of optical brain imaging and demonstrate important acquisition and analysis processes using the Kobe Studio software offered by FNIR Devices. Following, we will hear from Dr. Katulis Izatoglu, also an associate research professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering, Science and Health Systems at Drexel University. Dr. Izatoglu's current research focuses on the development of optical sensors, novel algorithms, and techniques to deploy functional near-infrared imaging in various application areas, including human performance assessment, cognitive workload, expertise development, and anesthesia monitoring during surgery. Today, he will share some of these novel applications and discuss how FNIR imaging is allowing scientists to make new thought-provoking discoveries. And the third portion of today's lecture will be delivered by Fraser Finley, CEO and Director of Biopack Systems Incorporated. Mr. Finley will present hardware components that permit the integration of optical brain imaging data with physiological measurements, such as electrodermal activity, body temperature, heart rate, gaze behavior, body movement, just to name a, name a few. He will also provide a live demonstration of how scientists can acquire and synchronize measurements using Biopack's Acknowledge Data Acquisition and Analysis software. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about principles of optical brain imaging, also called functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS. Uh, FNIRS is the youngest and still emerging neuroimaging technique compared to the traditional uh, uh, modalities. Uh, it measures the hemodynamic response uh, or cortical oxygenation changes similar to fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, but using a miniaturized and portable uh, uh, sensors using near-infrared light. So it is not a replacement uh, for any of the traditional neuroimaging techniques uh, as it has its own uh, unique set of um, features, advantages and disadvantages that sets it apart from other uh, modalities. It has a good balance of uh, temporal and spatial resolution and uh, with the portable uh, systems uh, it is suitable for measurement of brain function uh, in real world natural uh, environments. <laughs> Here you can see uh, the um, FNIR device's latest generation uh, prefrontal sensor pad that monitors the um, prefrontal uh, areas uh, underneath the forehead and can be used to um, study uh, cognitive, motor or affective brain functions uh, like such as uh, emotion regulation, motor control, fine, motor learning and etc. Um, so, just to briefly um, talk about um, uh, the, physio the physiological uh, uh, basis and the relationship to neural activity, uh, actually is true uh, neurovascular coupling and when neurons uh, at a particular area are activated, there is this increased oxygen need for that area and oxygen is uh, transferred to that area through uh, um, oxyhemoglobin uh, within the blood and when oxygen is released to the tissue oxyhemoglobin is converted into deoxygenated hemoglobin. So by uh, tracking uh, the changes of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin uh, in the uh, cortical uh, area we can uh, understand the activation and inhibition changes. Uh, so we are using near-infrared light to measure uh, this uh, hemoglobin concentration changes because near-infrared light can penetrate the tissue a few centimeters. 
And you can easily see this if you shine white light under your hand, you will see a reddish color. That's because all wavelengths are attenuated and red color that is close to near infrared can pass through. And if you place uh, light sources over the scalp, uh, the light will uh, uh, actually penetrate through the layers uh, of the skin, skull, um, and dura, and the cortical tissue, and a few of those actually will reach back to detectors uh, on the surface that are strategically placed. And this is because of the photon migration in the tissue, the scattering and absorption. Scattering is uh, the change of direction of photons due to different uh, layers, such as cell membranes. And absorption is uh, the loss of intensity. And it is because light-absorbing molecules or chromophores, such as deoxyhemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, and water within uh, the tissue. <coughs> so here you can see uh, uh, the FNIR uh, devices model uh, 1,000 unit uh, that uh, has been uh, widely used, um, developed initially at uh, Drexel University, and its design is based on Dr. Britton Chance, uh, who has been considered as the father of biomedical optics in, uh, in general. And uh, this uh, has been targeted as a portable system and with a computer, uh, laptop, or uh, small uh, computational unit, it can be uh, uh, carry it to different areas and uh, with a sensor pad that uh, is um, placed over the forehead that can measure the brain activation um, in, uh, uh, in a quick setup and uh, in uh, natural environments. And here uh, you can see the latest generation of the of this uh, sensor uh, that is uh, dramatically uh, improved in terms of uh, lighter, uh, thinner, um, and uh, can be a uh, you know, faster setup. Um, and uh, we have uh, used this in many studies, and many others are also uh, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating uh, different um, uh, brain function studies, uh, publications uh, throughout the literature. And uh, one exciting development is the uh, further miniaturization of the hardware particularly this wireless unit that uh, is uh, of the size of almost a uh, cell phone that contains uh, all the hardware, the battery, and the wireless transmission. And when the sensor is placed over uh, the participant, this uh, unit can be uh, attached to the belt or uh, placed in, in a pocket, uh, allowing the individual to be completely untethered and mobile. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have been uh, using this in uh, various studies, enables uh, unique opportunities for brain function research, uh, like a study that uh, we recently um, completed uh, is using this system to monitor the brain function of uh, participants uh, that uh, are mobile walking outdoors. So they were uh, performing special navigation tasks and uh, we were able to monitor uh, their brain function with uh, also secondary tasks, uh, with audio uh, working memory, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, protocols that uh, could not be done with uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, FNIR systems. And uh, there are other applications in clinical domain or for, from pediatric neonatal research to elderly uh, is possible. And here are some uh, examples uh, of uh, publications that we describe the system, the hardware, and uh, example application studies. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's uh, talk a, a little bit about the measurement uh, steps. So uh, we can uh, use near infrared light uh, because within uh, the 700 to 900 nanometer wavelength range, the absorption of light in the tissue is minimal. Um, so you can see the absorption spectra here. The most abundant molecule, uh, water, uh, actually minimally absorbs the light. And lucky for us, within this wavelength range, uh, oxy and deoxy hemoglobin are the main chromophores that interact with light. That's why we can use this um, 
wavelength range, usually uh, two wavelengths, so that we can differentiate between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. <clears throat> to talk about um, uh, the calculation of uh, concentration changes, we use modified beer lambert law. Um, so here is a um, most simple uh, setup of one optode, one light source and detector, and the optical density uh, of the region between the light source and detector is defined as the logarithmic ratio of input light intensity versus output light intensity, and this is also uh, related to the absorption coefficient of the medium, the concentration of the chromophore times uh, the, dist the corrected distance, d time dpf, the differential path length factor, plus uh, intrinsic factors that are modeled as g here. And if we use uh, the same light intensity at two different times and subtracting that, we get the change in optical density, delta od, is now equal to the logarithmic ratio of uh, measurements only, the uh, input light intensity is cancelled out, so logarithm of uh, measurement at rest and measurement versus measurement at test now equals to the absorption coefficient times change in concentration times uh, the corrected distance. So in this equation we have two unknowns, the delta concentration changes of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, so we use uh, a second wavelength repeat the whole uh, procedure so that we have two equations and two unknowns that we can solve for. And uh, if we repeat this whole procedure uh, at multiple times at each uh, sample, then we can arrive to a time series, and this is for oxy hemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, total hemoglobin, which is the summation of the two and allows us to estimate the cerebral uh, blood volume. And the difference between dam oxygenation and the various other uh, parameters, oxygen saturation index and etc., can be estimated from uh, the measurements. And we can use these time traces to compare different experimental conditions, like here rest versus uh, task execution, uh, when these events are marked on the, um, uh, on the time series. And uh, when we repeat this whole procedure at different brain areas, multiple brain areas, then we can calculate a spectrotemporal pattern of activation that can be used to compare uh, different experimental conditions such as easy task versus a difficult task or between group designs such as healthy versus clinical group, etc. So this is the, 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 the basis of uh, the experimental design, I guess. And in terms of the signals themselves, uh, so we uh, have time series for each uh, optode, and uh, we have a lot of uh, oscillations on the signals themselves. So the signals contain physiological um, uh, artifacts uh, such as respiration, heart rate, and vascular oscillations, and also motion artifacts that can be spikes up and down that uh, contaminate the data themselves. So um, these are all noise for us, and we want to get rid of them to uh, assess the actual brain activation data. And uh, it is in itself a, a growing literature, uh, and there has been uh, various uh, algorithms have been developed, and we have developed and others, and it's a growing literature, uh, and we can say all these methods are uh, getting smarter and uh, much better so that we can evaluate actually the brain activation even in natural environments such as outdoors uh, and even uh, um, when the participant is mobile, moving. So here are uh, some couple of example uh, references and just to mention uh, uh, some uh, common issues uh, in the signals that would be uh, actually important to recognize just at the beginning of a data collection session because if uh, you uh, recognize them, it, it can be <coughs> easy to fix as simple as just moving the sensor pad or uh, moving the, the, the optodes uh, and it will be fixed in a second, but if they are not recognized, uh, it's just a rec recording of uh, problematic signals. So some examples are um, bad contacts, like you can see on the left uh, top figure, 
or saturation, as you can see on the top right figure. And saturation is uh, here, the blue line is one of the wavelengths, but still, uh, because of the saturation, even with one channel, we need to reject the entire optode because saturation means we are losing data before even it is digitized. That's because the light uh, level is too high that it is beyond the capacity of the detector, so we can't even um, capture the data itself. So we need to lower the signal uh, by, uh, for example, lowering the um, uh, gains or uh, LED uh, in light intensity so that uh, it is uh, now in the valid dynamic range. So another problem like our motion artifacts as you can see on the lower left figure like spikes up and down. Uh, so these are uh, problems but they can be uh, uh, corrected and it is the data is still uh, usable, it can be cleaned. And on the lower right hand side you can see a good uh, signal example. Um, and uh, finally, I, I will just uh, go over the common steps uh, for the processing pipeline. And if you start with the raw light intensity measures, uh, we have uh, this, uh, these are the NIR files from Kobe Studio, and it has a lot of oscillations, a lot of uh, noise in it. But uh, we apply low pass filtering uh, or SMAR uh, motion artifact rejection and various preprocessing steps and then apply beer lombard law to the entire session or specified uh, periods related to the uh, experimental paradigm to reach uh, oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin changes, HBO and HPR changes. And we can continue the preprocessing steps, apply further filtering, detrending, uh, CBSI and various other uh, algorithms uh, then to reach filtered, refined HPO, HPR time series. And then uh, the next step would be to uh, um, apply feature extraction, that is marking the time series for uh, specific blocks, periods that are relevant for the experimental paradigm. So we need to understand when the subject performed a specific task, such as easy task started and ended versus a difficult task started and ended, so that we can look at the brain activation for, the, for that specific task. As a functional neuroimaging system, we need to do this as in other uh, methodologies. Uh, and then we can extract uh, the blocks uh, for uh, block analysis, for event-related analysis, and we can further apply uh, preprocessing such as uh, baseline correction and others, and then we can extract uh, representative features such as mean, median, standard deviation, time to peak, uh, and uh, various others uh, to represent that iteration, and we usually have multiple iterations of multiple tasks, then that can go to in, into statistical analysis. Uh, which can uh, be any, anything from uh, t-test ANOVA, repeated measures ANOVA, to uh, uh, GLM or uh, linear mixed models. And uh, that allows us to test versus hypotheses uh, related to the experimental paradigm within subject designs or across uh, between groups. So uh, I guess uh, that's it for me to give you an overview. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Kurtulu Shizetolo is going to share a couple of uh, field applications. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ayaz. And, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I think you, you're seeing now my screen, hopefully. And uh, uh, as Dr. Ayaz mentioned, I'm going to talk about the field applications, but of course, I cannot go over the each one of it because as you may know if uh, understanding the signal understanding the system now enable us to deploy the system in many areas so but uh, so uh, so we have been we have been reading or seeing the, a lot of the literature and the applications coming out of uh, 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 using this uh, system here I will be just focusing on four, four applications and I kind of classify into the two parts. One is the clinical application and non-clinical application just to give you the flavor how we can use this system and how we can uh, 
how we can uh, use those biomarkers that uh, Dr. Ayaz just mentioned uh, in his presentation. So let's start with the first one, and this is the this is the use of FNIR in uh, in operating room settings. Uh, the research here the focus is on to uh, to explore the possible biomarkers derived from the FNIRs. Uh, in detecting the uh, depth of anesthesia as well as the over sedation. So uh, if you look at it, the, uh, uh, the two biomarkers that just mentioned oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin just we can acquire from the FNIR. Here we saw that deoxygen, uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin actually it, it seems like a good candidate uh, uh, to use in a in in this operating room settings, so this is just a proof of concept study, and we needed to further support. And as you will see in the next uh, slide on the right side, uh, deoxygenation hemoglobin actually the, during the deep anesthesia showed very slow rate of change compared to the light anesthesia. We saw really the higher rate of the changes. So this is a, this is a good indication of the, how this, these biomarkers can be used in operating room settings and uh, to to detect the, not only the uh, depth of anesthesia but also also the over sedation. Uh, so the, the research is still going on, and I just provided the reference, but please feel free to access it to see more details. The follow another study, another clinical study to, uh, to using this FNIR is the neurorehabilitation. The here. Uh, here is the research uh, is to use FNIR and, and, and then investigate whether we can, uh, we can uh, differentiate the signal uh, between the healthy subject to TBI patients. So, uh, and actually the, I just put a couple of like results on the right side, you'll see the really there's a significant difference between the TBI patient and the healthy subject. So another interesting uh, approach in this uh, application is to use the FNIR and EEG together. Uh, and uh, I, I provided also reference on the left side, on the left bottom, and uh, the idea here is to use the FNIR and EEG together and explore the features from these two signals, two model, different modalities actually, and then to come up to a better classifier. Uh, the classifier is, to, is, is being used to, uh, again, to differentiate the TBI versus the control subjects. So actually, the, the, if, you, if you check the paper, you will see the classifier has, has a better performance if you combine these two and fuse the data. So there's a lot of also data fusion is going on in terms of the research uh, combining these modalities. So this is a, this is a good indication of if NEO can be used with other technologies and can be fused uh, to, to come up to better uh, identification. So. So the another one, the, just to show you the how we use FNIR in mobile while the subject is walking. In this condition is the cognitive aging. The, the population is uh, over the 65 years old, and this is really a recent study, and the paper just coming out uh, starting in 2015, and another one just came out this year. And uh, the study uh, here, FNIR is combined with the gate, uh, and you will see the, on the right side the walkway uh, of, uh, that that's a gate uh, the gate analysis there and uh, and then we we look at here we look at the attention resources of those elderly population and compare with their the gate and then to see if we can really if we can help them to reduce the fall because of the attention loss so uh, that's why we here if near has been used to monitor their attention resources and then to see if, if there's any correlation uh, bit, or for, uh, with, between their motion and attention. So the study is actually revealed that there is a highly correlated uh, and their attention level can be improved and if you can monitor those treatment strategies. So this is one of the applications. I'm going to be brief, but I provided the references so that you can go uh, if you need any uh, further details. 
So in the next slide, you'll see it's a couple of applications, and, and because I want to change the uh, gear here, I want to focus on non-clinical application and to see, to, to tell you like what's going on in terms of the human performance assessment and why uh, such technologies are being used in that one. Uh, the reason is to use such technologies to come up to actually better measurement of the human performance in a way, in a way like it's, it has to be the objective and it has to be the reliable and repeatable so, uh, so, so that the, we can assess the real true uh, workload of those operators. So one area uh, we have uh, been using this system in the air traffic controller and in that case we're monitoring the workload, their workload. Uh, similar to the air traffic controller, same application has been done in uh, for the unmanned uh, air vehicle ground controllers as well as the sensor operators. So the other one is also the in the pilots. We just uh, completed a study and we we kind of look at it, see one to the J pilot uh, skill acquisition and see if we can come up any biomarker or you name it like a biometric. Uh, to measure their uh, skill acquisition and quantitatively. So let's touch upon uh, one application, uh, uh, air traffic controller uh, case. In air, on the right side, you see this typical scene from air, uh, uh, an air ATC air traffic controller is dealing with in their daily life. So. In that one, uh, we, we here uh, we we were asked to see the workload changes between the legacy system versus the next generation system. In this case, next generation system is the data communication. In other words, the the pilot and ATCs are going to communicate using the texting. And uh, legacy system, the common practice uh, was to use the voice communication. So, so here the question was, the research question was whether the new system is going to introduce over, uh, workload compared to the legacy system. And we ramped up the traffic and changed the workload. As you see, the N uh, equals to 6, 12, 8. That means that the, 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 the number of aircraft we just changes to, to manipulate the workload. It's like a, a, m many of you are familiar with the MBAC task is a working memory task. This is similar to the working memory task. And then results on the right side uh, indeed show that uh, data communication, which was the uh, next generation system, actually introduced less workload compared to the voice communication. So. Uh, 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 the lower lower uh, line shows the data communication. Upper one is the voice communication. And by changing the number of aircraft, in, in other words, increase changing the workload, we didn't see much changes. Uh, we didn't see the higher workload compared to the uh, old system. That's kind of that was a good news because they those ATCs uh, need. Some of them even don't need training, or some of them needs just a minor training. So that's a that's a very good. Uh, research showing that, uh, showing how FNIR can be used in real-time settings. Uh, another one, as I mentioned, to use this system for the uh, US UAV uh, expertise development as well as the mental workload measurement while they're on the task. So this is one of the, one of the, one of the project we just completed and published uh, was to use FNIR while they, the, while our subjects pilot in the uh, predator in uh, actually here. This is the desktop simulator of the predator and then we look at the skill acquisition uh, while those subjects go through the uh, nine different sessions. They they come to the lab, they were all novice, then we monitor their uh, uh, skill acquisition. And uh, one of the I just show you. I'm just showing you now uh, one of the uh, one of the screenshot from our scenario. This is from the, the landing task, and this this is exactly the, what the uh, subject uh, saw during the session. And on the right side now, I think you you're seeing that the uh, the our, one of our results. Of course, there are uh, further uh, analysis and results and. Uh, you, you, uh, provided in the publication. This is just one of the results and uh, you see here the approach task uh, and landing task that we explored and in this in this study the uh, expertise level development or expertise development uh, uh, was investigated and the hypothesis was to see the uh, was to see the oxygen drop while the subject become uh, proficient. Uh, 
uh, because that was well known uh, with the expertise development uh, uh, as we be, as we become expert on a on a job or become get familiar with a with a with a task, we expect to see the drop uh, uh, drop in oxygenation in the prefrontal cortex area. So this is the prefrontal cortex area, and we see exactly the drop in the oxygenation as you look at the the two uh, two. Uh, graphs, the x-axis showing the, your uh, the expertise level, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and on the right side, on the y-axis, you see the total hemoglobin changes in the prefrontal cortex area. So, this is very much in line in the physiology uh, in terms of the expert, expert development. So, so to summarize, uh, I know I've been very quick on those of the each one is another one-hour presentation, but I think, I hope you get the, just the uh, idea of how we use this FNIR and how we uh, how we correlate those data with the, with the task. Uh, and to summarize uh, how why we use and how we use this FNIR, one one important uh, parameter for us is very it's easy to integrate with other sensors. So because you're dealing with a real time problem. In real time problem is very complex so you may need the second modality or third modality. So FNIR is really easy to integrate with other uh, other technologies, other sensors. And second thing, when you work in the field, uh, like an air traffic controller case, that was like a real time air ATCs just came to the facility and we really needed the shorter preparation time. And of course the, the Preparation time includes the calibration to check the, whether the quality of the signals are okay, and as well as the, to baseline those people in a very short, rapid time so that they can start and we, we're not going to bore those be people before the task. Uh, less intrusive, uh, critical in field studies, I think it's obvious here. Uh, we don't want to interfere with their workflow. And the other one is easy, really easy to interpret and relate to test-dependent analysis. Uh, this is because this is direct measure of the hemodynamic changes and as you heard in the previous presentation, hemodynamic changes are proven to be uh, associated with uh, brain activation and it's a direct measure and this is direct measure of the hemodynamic changes and it's very clear uh, and it's easy to correlate with the task, uh, task changes like a low workload versus high workload like high workload requires higher oxygenation, higher hemodynamic changes. So for end user also it's easy to understand and relate to their task or their work. And uh, the other things also I think well, many of us now focus on translational research, not just doing the less work in the lab, but we want to also take this from bench to the field. So, so the, that uh, calls for uh, some customization tailored to the whatever the, the, that domain is. So the here uh, FNIR system uses LEDs uh, and is, is, it is in a continuous way. So that kind of uh, enables us actually to easily customize the system. I think that concludes my part and I'm just going it over to Hassan, Dr. Ayaz again uh, to, to, to mention about the software that, uh, that we can do the data analysis and uh, also some uh, task dependent analysis. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, hello again, uh, uh, everybody. So um, now I would like to show you um, common steps in the data analysis using FNIRSOFT uh, analysis tool that we have developed. So here is the main window of, uh, of the software, and um, we can actually uh, uh, use this tool to do a graphical analysis. That is, by visualizing the signals, we can perform various analysis steps and we can see the data uh, as it changes and we can uh, see uh, the processing steps uh, and then um, visualize and uh, extract uh, meaningful features. Also we can perform um, all these through automation by writing scripts and uh, we can uh, um, uh, prefer to do a mixture of uh, both uh, as uh, the study dictates. But uh, today I'm going to show you the graphical uh, interface for uh, one type of uh, analysis. So to start with, let's go and load a uh, sample data. To do that from the file menu item uh, at the top, uh, I click uh, open sample data 
and I will uh, see uh, all the sample files, uh, data files that are available to me in the folder. So you can see NIR files that are actually light intensity measures and OXY files are hemoglobin data uh, for the same recording session that were generated by Kobe Studio software. So uh, here let's start with the light intensity measures. So when I click that, it opens uh, the, um, the data file in a new light graph tool and also asking me if I would like to load the event uh, the, that is the marker file associated with this data file. So I click load and now I immediately see the vertical lines on the time, tr uh, time series. Uh, so these vertical lines are different events that have a unique identifier as a number that indicates different um, type of uh, activity, like different events, like onset of a task or uh, end of a task that are important to us uh, for that particular experimental protocol. So in the graph uh, we see uh, all um, uh, channels uh, that were recorded. So here we have 48 channels and they are grouped uh, by colors. You can see three different colors um, and uh, that is the two wavelengths, um, uh, 730 and 850 nanometers and if you click on them you can see this is for example uh, the 850 uh, wavelength and then the ambient light channel at the bottom that uh, can be used to uh, assess the signal quality and um, um, uh, the, uh, the recording, uh, you know, artifacts. So we can change uh, the uh, display of the information by looking at different wavelengths. Uh, we can just focus on one wavelength at a time or we can uh, look at uh, different uh, quadrants, different uh, areas uh, like the lateral areas or versus the medial uh, areas and uh, observe the data. Uh, we can uh, change the data signal ranges to better identify different issues, put manual ranges. If you have a touch screen, you can pinch and uh, pan and uh, scroll different to different areas. We can look at the raw data or refined data that is after certain pre-processing steps are applied. We don't uh, have right now anything, so it's disabled. Or we can uh, uh, change which type of markers are going to be displayed, especially useful if you have hundreds of different markers, we can limit and uh, only display uh, relevant markers that are of interest. We can of course change uh, the time uh, um, ranges, uh, custom ranges or based on predefined blocks and then we can just uh, monitor those. Um, so let's um, apply uh, actually uh, certain pre-processing steps. To do that I'm uh, going to click on the refine button over here and it pops up this uh, wizard that allows me to do the selection. I will start with the raw data and hit next and now uh, I can select uh, what type of um, um, uh, type of uh, pre processing that I would like to apply. So I will go for an SMAR that uh, we have actually published how uh, it operates in a couple of publications before. So I will keep the default settings and I will hit apply. And what I uh, see is immediately there is this output on the main window that it has actually uh, identified 36 plus uh, regions uh, and then uh, they are also uh, eliminated from the, the time series. So what's happening is no data is deleted, it's just marking those specific areas as uh, rejected areas uh, that are, were contaminated. And we can see this uh, more clearly if we look at um, each opt-out uh, next to each other. So I will go to opt-out layout view. So that opens up um, a new window that actually has all the uh, 16 opt-outs configured by 2 by 8 configuration similar to this uh, actual uh, layout on the sensor pad. Uh, so this is the left uh, side is the left of the subject and right is the right side of the subject. So let's take out the markers so that we can look at the uh, signals. So I will actually uh, go back and change so that uh, all the channels are displayed. So now we can see all um, the channels are visible and if I uh, click for example these 
I can see certain areas are rejected because of the motion artifacts uh, that were identified by the SMAR. So, um, let's uh, go ahead and, and further actually we can apply uh, if there were saturation or further other issues they would be rejected as well and we may apply ourselves for uh, uh, rejection like we can say this entire uh, channel needs to be rejected and based on the invest uh, visual uh, inspection we can uh, eliminate certain uh, areas time periods or um, channels uh, by the, uh, the, uh, the signal processing expert. So let's continue with our uh, uh, analysis. So I will click refine again and this time I would like to apply um, low pass filtering. So I will I have two options again start with the raw data to create a new set of refined data or I can start with the refined data that was actually the output of ESMAR. So I will continue with that. So I click next, and here uh, the FIR filtering. Uh, I can actually go and design a new filter, like in, with this tool, and uh, I can input different parameters: uh, low pass, band fast, different orders, different cutoff uh, frequencies, and I can see the frequency response of that filter in the graph here. So for this exercise, I will keep the default filter, and when I click apply. You can see the signals are smoothed immediately, uh, and uh, the, now the refined data is um, uh, actually uh, much more, uh, you know, smoother. The SMAR and uh, uh, both uh, the low pass filter is applied. So as a next step, let's actually go to the oxygenation data in the deoxy and oxyhemoglobin concentrations. So to do that, I will click uh, the oxy button here on the tool bar, lower toolbar and this brings up the oxygenation calculation window. So I have uh, the option to select different baselines. So uh, the default baseline is the Kobe Studio baseline that was uh, recorded at the beginning of uh, the session or I can use different time periods blocks uh, that are defined here in this slide graph or uh, in the data space as variable. So for this exercise, I will use the default baseline. And then for the data, we will um, use the refined data, the one that uh, is pre-processed. And I will click Calculate Oxygenation. And I have now a new oxygraph window that displays time series for the hemoglobin concentration changes. And we have two different colors. O the oxyhemoglobin is the red, and the oxyhemoglobin is the blue. And we can see the color coding here. And uh, we see all the opt-outs, uh, 16 opt-outs uh, on the same graph over here. Uh, we can change the display. Uh, uh, again, we can show different biomarkers, um, different uh, HP uh, parameters, or raw and refined. Again, refined is not available right now because we haven't applied anything yet uh, on the oxygraph window. Uh, we can again uh, look at different range values uh, or like we can if we have a touch screen we can just pinch and pan and zoom again. Uh, we can change the marker display, uh, the time series and uh, similar to the light graph um, settings. So as a next step actually let's um, um, uh, define uh, blocks. So this is to identify time periods of interest uh, like or define epochs that are relevant to experimental paradigms such as um, the, the periods of uh, different task uh, iterations such as easy task versus difficult task. So we have a tool here, define blocks, that allows us to identify uh, all these uh, through different uh, programmatic settings. So we can uh, identify the beginning of a block and end of a block as a pattern. So um, so this, this whole pattern is searched throughout this, either by markers or time information, so that uh, as many uh, blocks as uh, the patterns uh, define uh, is created. So for this example, let's create uh, blocks that start with marker 90. So I click here uh, to identify the marker 90 as uh, my start pattern, and as an end, I will select another marker, marker 50. So this configuration will search 
blocks that has that starts with 90 and ends with 50. So I, I can give actually a label, uh, a designation to these. So I will say these are 90 um, uh, blocks. When I click run, uh, now this tool search throughout uh, this data and uh, tells me that there are two blocks with this configuration. And then when I click save, I can see those blocks immediately marked on the data. Okay, so this is uh, the first one. So let's actually change this now. Instead of 90, I want to have 92 as another set of blocks. So uh, this is now going to search again on the data and it will mark blocks that starts with 92 and ends with 50. So for label, I will give them uh, label 92. Uh, this is very useful for uh, actually grouping all these blocks later on, uh, assigning labels. So when I click run, I can see now again this configuration from two blocks. And when I click save, now I can see both uh, are now marked. So in total, we have four blocks. And if I click manage, actually, I can see all these four blocks. I can see their time. I can sort them in different ways. Or I can delete unnecessary ones. So I close. Uh, so we can go back to this data again. Uh, so we can uh, actually uh, apply further uh, processing over here. So if we click refine, we can again uh, start with this uh, raw data of uh, hemoglobin. And then we can apply different filtering, uh, low pass, detrending, and various other uh, algorithms. So let's apply detrending in this case. And uh, now um, uh, we have uh, the blocks defined. We applied all the necessary um, uh, steps. Uh, so now let's extract the features. So to further uh, uh, the extraction, I will click the Save button. That allows me to save all the blocks, or I can actually identify all recorded data from beginning to end, or in this case, all blocks. And I'm going to get the refined blocks data. Uh, and or the alternative uh, is getting the raw data or only the time periods, like the beginning and end of the blocks instead of the data of the blocks. So I will uh, just get the refined data. And next, uh, it, uh, it will save these as variable uh, into data space. And then when I click uh, Save, I s see the success message. And now I'm uh, able to see the um, uh, the data space uh, window. So in this window, we see the list of all uh, variables in the memory, starting with the light graph and oxygraph objects, and then we see that all these uh, blocks that we have just saved. And these are four blocks, uh, all HPO, HPR, uh, HPT, and Oxy, plus the time information, of course. So I can click on any of these, I can click and uh, look at the block data itself. I can look at the raw data uh, or numeric information. Or I can visualize the graph in uh, different uh, uh, ways, like the opt-out layout, 2 by 8, uh, or all-in-one, or 1 by uh, x configurations. Um, then, actually, um, more interesting, I want to see all the uh, HPO data together, multiple of them. So I can filter the blocks here. I can see only HPO data. And I will select all of them by keeping control button uh, pressed. And if I click uh, view, now I can see all these um, different uh, blocks selected and uh, displayed uh, simultaneously. So uh, we can see the four uh, block information here. We used the, the um, labels, so we can now group them automatically. So if I hit auto, I will see that the coloring now changed to two uh, groups, uh, 90 and 92 groups. And I can further go and select it. Instead of individual blocks, I can say, uh, draw me the aggregate information. So this way, we can immediately uh, uh, see uh, from it could be hundreds of different blocks, different iterations from many different uh, uh, participants. We can, by just doing a couple of clicks, we can see 
the comparison of those experimental conditions and um, the, the, the comparison. So we can further, instead of uh, bar graph, we can do temporal graph, we can look at the time uh, changes, we can um, uh, apply different types of uh, uh, visualization uh, like uh, all-in-one or from in uh, opt-out configuration to further compare these. So another step is actually let's uh, apply, right now we just extracted these blocks from a time series, so let's actually um, apply baseline correction to these using the, uh, the processing tool over here. So this tool allows me to input certain variables, select an action to perform and execute that. So first of all, let's apply, select HPO parameters here as my input variables and in terms of uh, action, I'm going to select uh, correct baseline and when I click execute, I see that as an uh, output, four variables were created. If I go to data space, now I can see all those new variables are created here and we, we see that the same label and information is uh, kept. So we can uh, look at this now again, uh, selecting all of them together and I, again I can just uh, uh, keep, the, uh, because of the labels I can auto group them and if I do the aggregate view, now I can compare this contrast. And as you can see, if we now do the baseline correction, we can see a better differentiation, especially in the um, right lateral areas that wasn't visible before the baseline uh, correction because the data was diluted. So uh, we can uh, apply different processing steps that um, actually uh, better uh, enables us to see the contrast. So before I finish, there are various other tools, but maybe I should mention a little bit about the topograph tool. Uh, so topograph tool allows us to visualize the data. We can just uh, load uh, hemoglobin data uh, to look at the brain activation patterns, or we can uh, load uh, statistical uh, results like uh, F scores and uh, other parameters to demonstrate the significant uh, region of interest. So as an example, let's uh, load one of these uh, variables. And we can see uh, now uh, all the 16 opt-outs, and if we uh, turn it into the interpolation border, uh, we can uh, see the activation pattern uh, of the sensor, and this is one time instance, so we can look at all these uh, different uh, time series by looking at uh, the slider to see uh, the special configuration, the pattern of the data at one instant. So we can actually record it even as um, um, uh, as a, a video from all this, uh, we can play it and uh, look at this at different speeds. And actually, we can also visualize this um, using the anatomical landmarks to a, um, a brain surface image. And here you can see the uh, brain activation registered on the brain surface image. We can look at different thresholds that can be defined by the statistical significance level or FDR analysis or different types of analysis, so we can see which areas were activated for that particular uh, experimental condition. We can save this as an image, we can save the time series, or we can save this as a video file. Hello everybody, uh, thank you Andy for the introduction and thank you Katulis and Hassan for your great presentations and the detailed information about FNIR devices and the NIRS technology. Biopack offers a range of solutions that will allow you to synchronize optical brain imaging data with other physiological such as ECG, respiration, electrodermal activity, etc. Our products are used by 97% of the top universities and here are some of the Biopack platforms that will allow you to easily synchronize the FNIA data with other physiological signals. On the left hand side, starting with the MP160, MP150 system with either wired 100C series tethered amplifiers or the wireless bionomatics amplifiers that will allow you to record a wide range of physiological signals to the four channel MP36 system with built in universal amplifiers that allow you to record your choice of physiological signals to the Mobita 32 channel EEG or biopotential wireless telemetry or data logging system. And finally, the nine channel B-Alert EEG headset 
with cognitive states metric software for determining subject fatigue, stress, confusion, engagement, and workload. Each of the devices can be interfaced with FNIA hardware to synchronize the data. And synchronization with stimulus response and virtual reality systems is easily managed with Biopack recording platforms. Stimulus event marks from Superlab, E-Prime, Presentation, and Biopack virtual reality systems are delivered to both the FNIA system and the other recording device. In the case of VR, biofeedback from the physiological signals can also be used to control the virtual experience. It's also possible to synchronize our range of static eye tracking systems and the data from mobile eye tracking glasses can also be synchronized with FNIA and other physiological signals. <clears throat> Finally, facial expressions can also be monitored and subject video monitoring can also be synchronized with the previously mentioned signals and devices. Biopack provides great solutions for managing and synchronizing all of the devices and signals. In this example, we show the popular MP160, MP150 system interfaced with one of the FNIR platforms. So on the left-hand side, top left-hand side, we can see the MP160 system. On the right-hand side of the slide, we can see the FNIR device and the sensor array. <clears throat> The important part of the system here is shown in the lower left-hand corner. This is the STP100C module. This provides optical isolation between the subject and the FNIR device. And the FNIR hardware has a BNC connector on the rear that allows the hardware to send trigger information for starting and stopping of the device and the beginning and ending of baseline periods and the recording of the FNIR um, data. Each time one of these events occurs, a trigger is sent from the FNIR hardware to the STP100C. <clears throat> if you're using stimulus presentation systems, and in particular, um, E-Prime Superlab presentation, the stimulus presentation platform will provide event mark information that, we, that will be delivered to both the MP160, MP150 and the FNIR computer via the parallel port or the serial port. So markers are displayed as digital channels in Acknowledge, in the Acknowledge software, and as vertical lines in the Kobe software temporal data view. So when the stimulus presentation system advances to a new task or provides a different form of stimulation, a trigger is sent to both of these devices. It's also possible to use the stimulus presentation markers to control the FNIA device to start baseline and start and stop recording of data. Okay, now let's take a look at the software and see how all of this comes together. So, I've got the system set up here. I have a volunteer in my office with me. The participant in this case is wearing EDA, which you'll see in the top left signal of the Acknowledge software on the left-hand side of my screen, ECG, and then a uh, channel of digital input information from the FNIR device, and then heart rate at the bottom. On the right-hand side, we're looking at the Kobe Studio software. And this is the software that controls the data collection portion. And I have a cable running from the BNC trigger output of the FNIR device connected to the STP100C of the MP150 system. If we go ahead and start the Acknowledge software, and if I auto-scale this, we can see we're getting some EDA from our participant. 
we've got ECG, we've got their heart rate, and we can see a flat line for our digital trigger information. Over on the right-hand side, I'm going to start a new experiment. And I've got some information that I, that I can enter there about the, pro, the experiment, the participant. And this view that I'm showing is going to be the 16 oxygenated hemoglobin signals. And you'll see the activity levels appearing in the display up above. I'm going to start the device. And by starting the device, we can see this trigger has immediately appeared in the acknowledge waveform in channel number three there. So that is the immediate degree of synchronization. We know, now know precisely in the physiological record when the device was started. We can move along to a baseline period. Again, we can see another event mark has been entered. And I'm going to use some adaptive scaling for my EDA. Um, the end of the baseline has been marked. Baseline periods end automatically. We've got an another marker there showing us the beginning of our recording period. And we can see the oxygenated hemoglobin data changing as we're looking at our subject. So I'm going to stop the collection. I'm going to stop the device. So now that FNIR data has been saved. And those event marks that appeared in the software will also be available for the analysis within the FNIR soft software. Now what I'm going to do is show how we would use this with a stimulus presentation system. So I'm going to start my data collection. So again, I've got ECG, EDA, but now I'm showing a lot of digital I.O. data. And this is controlled via the digital channels. I've got eight digital lines turned on. Over on the right-hand side, I'm going to start a new experiment. I'm going to start the current device. <clears throat> we can see markers are appearing on the digital lines. I'm going to start a baseline. In a moment, we'll see the end of baseline marker appear. And we see the end of baseline marker up here. Now, to try and simplify things a little bit, rather than using a stimulus presentation system, I'm using a parallel port tester. And the parallel port tester will allow me to simulate triggers coming from a stimulus presentation system. And I'm going to make sure I've got this turned on correctly. And we can see both in the FNIR data and the acknowledged software, the different markers that I'm putting in. So each time a new task is being performed or some form of stimulation is being presented to the participant, we're able to see that both in the COBE software and in the Acknowledge software. Meanwhile, we've still been recording our physiological data, and we've got everything ready for further analysis. So I'm going to stop the devices. Stop my physiological data collection. So now everything is highly synchronized. We know when the device was started and stopped. We know when our stimuli were presented to the subject. Now I've got an example here. Here's an example of some EDA data with some e ECG. I've got a phasic signal as well as the tonic. I've got heart rate from my participant. And down below, I've got some event marker information. So in Acknowledge, it's possible to automate the analysis process so I can convert this TTL information 
into meaningful data for Acknowledge. So to do that, I come into Stim Response, and I'm going to convert the digital input. I'm going to convert these two channels here. And what this will do, I'm going to enter a trigger threshold, this will create event marks within Acknowledge, and then Acknowledge will use those for um, data presentation. And this is important because this allows us to speed up the analysis process. And now we can see along the top, we've got these yellow light bulbs, and these have been labeled within the software. This is a type one event. This is a type two. And so these represent the two stimuli that were presented down below. Now we can go into the electrodermal activity analysis and do an event-related analysis. So I'm going to look at the GSR. I'm going to use the phasic EDA signal. And I'm going to look at a time window what between one and four seconds after the stimulation occurred, and I'm going to determine whether there are any skin conductance responses that are specific, and then compare the difference between specific and non-specific. So we can see that the software has automatically gone through and scored the electrodermal activity data by putting blue water drops where um, skin conductance responses have occurred, and then we can see there are a couple of specific skin conductance responses that have been marked with a red water drop and a label. Now all those results are available within Acknowledge for the specific versus the non-specific. Then we get other information regarding the frequency of the occurrence of specific to non-specific. We can also run a quick analysis on the heart rate data. So to do that, I'm going to come over and perform a stim response analysis. And I'm going to look at a five second period at each of the stimulus events. And I'm going to output the results to Excel. And I've got a bunch of measurements that are already set up. I hit OK. And now we these are the results for stimulus one, these are the results for stimulus two, and we've looked at five second time periods after each of the stimulus events. We can also go in and perform heart rate variability. We can do a full ECG lead two analysis, but the most important part is the synchronization between the FNIA data, the stimulus response, and the physiological signals that were coming in. It's also possible to enter manual event marks within the COBE software. So any manual event can be entered. Uh, same goes in the Acknowledge software as well. So hopefully that gives you a quick overview of both the Kobe software and Acknowledge. And in summary, um, it is possible to combine the FNIA physiological data with other signals such as ECG, EEG, et cetera. You can interface with stimulus presentation systems such as E-Prime Superlab presentation and also Biopack virtual reality systems. You can also combine that with the monitoring of eye position, gaze path, and facial expressions, and combine all of that with um, video of the participants. And then all of that is done while maintaining synchronization across the devices. Okay, Andy, I'm going to hand it back over to you for a quick Q&A session. Thank you, Frazier, for that excellent uh, presentation and demonstration as well. And um, yes, I'm going to bring back uh, Hassan and Kurtulis online. Uh, gentlemen, are you with us? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yes. Good to have you back. 
All right. Well, yes. Uh, let's get right into our um, our Q and A session. And thanks again for those that are hanging on a bit after the hour with us today. Um, I'm going to start off uh, with a question to you, Hassan. Um, we've had a couple uh, questions come in about how FNIR uh, compares with fMRI, particularly bold signals. And could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, this is a very uh, good question. Uh, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, bold signal, a blood oxygen level uh, dependent signal, actually measures the hemodynamic response. And FNIRS uh, is also measuring uh, this hemodynamic response. So the underlying uh, physiological, neurophysiological phenomenon is the same, uh, but uh, they are using different modalities, different type of technologies, like fMRI using the superconductive magnet, huge uh, device versus FNIRS using near-infrared light with a variable uh, platform. And of course, there are different uh, features, uh, like uh, fMRI allows measure measurement of the uh, entire brain versus FNIRS can only measure outer cortex closer to the um, uh, skin, uh, to the uh, outside of the um, brain. Uh, but also there are differences uh, of the signal itself. FMRI uh, has very high temp spatial resolution, like on millimeter scale, versus FNIRS uh, is on centimeter lower spatial resolution. But on the other side, FNIRS has a very high temporal resolution that is very uh, fast um, measurements can be done uh, to look at the higher temporal dynamics uh, of the signals. So as you can see, there are uh, advantages and disadvantages to both, but I guess it's important to understand from FNIR's uh, perspective that fMRI literature presents excellent opportunities to understand and explore different experimental paradigms that can be actually used uh, as preliminary results to understand which brain areas, if relevant to FNIR's measurements areas, uh, for that specific protocol and can be replicated with um, FNIRS uh, measurements. So this is an active research area, but um, it is uh, very synergistic and uh, relevant. Yeah. I guess, um, I hope this gives uh, an overview, because this is such an important topic that even we can have a whole presentation lecture just on this. No, I, certainly that's, I imagine that's a great answer. Uh, um, any additions from our other presenters or? Okay, I'll take silence as, as, as no, and we'll, let's move on to our next one. No, that was a great answer. Thank you, Hassan. Um, next question, uh, I'm going to ask this to Kertulis. Uh What is the typical operator learning curve, and what uh, is the FNIR calibration process? You, you, it was discussed a bit in our presentation, but maybe you could go over it and expand a bit. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I'm just going. To, I, we don't have any quantitative data. I just my answer to this question will rely on our experience in the field, uh, because we are really applied researchers and we work on the development of this technology and as well as the use of this technology in the field. And we experience two, uh, two, two main components in the training during the training. One is the making sure the system is up and running. And this uh, and the operators are, uh, are comfortable uh, running the the copy and acquiring the data, and that if we if we just mention about that part, you know, like getting the system up and running and uh, and the, using the copy, really straightforward. So answer to your question in terms of the learning curve, like experience versus learning, I I would say sh very short. Okay. Uh, however, I just want to I just want to uh, be frank here. Uh, in terms of to getting the uh, acquiring high quality signal, requires some experience and some familiarization with the with the with, with the sensor pad. We use that sensor pad, the the, the part we use on the forehead. Mm -hmm. I think that 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 may require some. Uh, some time to make sure we get we are getting the we are acquiring really the high quality signal. What I meant actually in the first presentation, you saw like a four different uh, graphs, like one graph showing the for example motion, uh, some spikes. Mm -hmm. Those are we call it motion artifact, and some uh, uh, some Hassan showed you know like the uh, very very weak contact with the skin. 
So we have to be like, we have to train ourselves and we have to practice in terms of getting this kind of high quality and make sure what we get in, what we are acquiring is com completely from the cortical area interest to us, not just the superficial or not just the uh, environment noise. So Perfect. No, that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, very good. Uh, actually, kind of along this lines, we've had a question come in just about are there any tips and tricks for optimizing the location of the sensory pad, particularly along the periphery. Um, I, I'm assuming that's maybe the, the, an area where it's most challenging to get a good signal. Uh, um, that's what I'm extrapolating from this question. Is that exactly. correct? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So any tips from you guys? I think I think uh, I just wanted to like the localization. This is critical. So uh, if, if we suggest some standardization for that, like nose is a reference, and we have a middle point on the on the 16 channel system. Okay. So that should that should point to nose, and as well as we always place the sensor on just on slightly above the eyebrows, mm -hmm. and we should follow the same approach for each subject, regardless of the size of the forehead. Okay. Because there's a, yeah high variances in this uh, in the forehead size, but we should stick to the original plan. Okay, just uh, above the eyebrows just, and uh, point in the nose. Yeah, just to add, it's just about using the anatomical landmarks, and yeah. also uh, in uh, like in uh, in EEG literature, like international 1020 system, uh, those uh, specific uh, landmark can also be uh, used uh, across the horizontal and vertical symmetry axis of the sensor pad. And we actually we uh, outline some of these procedures with uh, in, even with visually in the Journal of uh, Visualized Experiments uh, publication that uh, in, came out in 2011 actually. Okay, perfect. That might be helpful as well. Great. The other point as well to mention, Andy, is you know on a very practical level, the systems ship with headband headbands. Yes. And those do a pretty good job of holding the sensor in place. And if needs be, you can actually use two headbands. And sort of not only does it help hold the array in place, but it also helps to eliminate uh, light as well, ambient light. Great. Oh, no. Excellent. Great input. Um, okay. Um, Next question uh, I'm going to ask uh, this to you, Fraser. Is it possible to synchronize the physiological data and FNIR imaging data with a video recording either of the subject or of what the subject is viewing? And I think you touched on this, but maybe you can just, again, review for the audience how that actually works. Yeah, there's a couple of ways in which this can be done. If you're just doing classic video monitoring and you're in the lab and you've got static video cameras set up, the video can be fully synchronized with um, the physiological data and the optical brain imaging and any stimulus presentation system. But it's also possible to take that a step further if you're doing mobile applications and you can so in addition, you can use the eye tracking glasses. They also have a camera on them, so you can see exactly where the participant is looking and what they're doing at any given moment in time. And then all of that becomes synchronized with the physiological signals as well. Okay, excellent. Um... Going back to, well, just signal acquisition or, or you know, co-registering data, um, Allison has asked, how can subjects wear both EEG and FNIR, um, the headband, together? You know, um, is there any special way to, to uh, arrange that on a, on a subject, you know? So, yeah, there's a couple of, couple of ways. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Fraser, if you, yeah, if you want to. No, 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 go ahead. So um, we have actually completed several studies uh, using uh, AEG and FNIRS published uh, some already and uh, depending on uh, you know the EEG cap uh, we can just place the FNIRS sensor uh, first and then uh, the EEG cap uh, on top of it or vice versa. Uh, so one issue is uh, the frontal electrodes like FP1 and FP2 and uh, it is, uh, you know, possible that they are usually contaminated with eye blinks and other facial muscles. In any case, so we uh, skip them. We don't include them. 
so that makes uh, the integration easier. But if you want to include them, then you can uh, um, actually uh, attach those electrodes independent of the head cap and record those underneath the sens uh, this, um, uh, sensor pad as well. Okay. Uh, I just want to add. Was, uh, yeah, going sorry. to mention, sorry. Just want to add that two things. I would suggest strongly suggest that the they kind of look for they should look for the AEG caps with the, it comes with the free electrodes, so that you can easily like play around place uh, uh, place it. And second, uh, B Alert has a good system also. You can just put as a cap on top of the FNIR. I think we use together and it's. We don't we don't experience any problem except the, just the forehead sensors as on machine. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, uh, Hassan. With the B Alert headset, the uh, electrode array is held in place using a headband. So the headband can actually be used to hold the FNIA sensor array in place as well. And then with that device, not only do you get the raw EEG, you also get the cognitive states metrics as well, so you get engagement, workload, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, exactly. very good. Okay, great. Um, in moving in a different direction, um, Spencer has asked: When data is removed by filtering due to unwanted artifact, do you recommend a method of managing missing data? So this is going back to FNIRSoft in the in the process you showed Hassan. And there's also some uh, suggestions here, or some question marks: uh, mean substitution, Windsoring, uh, multiple imputation. Um, mm -hmm. Can you perhaps comment on that? Sure. So it depends, of course, on the level of contamination and the experimental protocol. But if you're uh, going to do block analysis over a large uh, number of blocks. Uh, and it is possible that if the block is long enough, the contamination may not cover the entire block itself, like only a small portion of that. Then if you get an average activation of that area, taking out, uh, rejecting the uh, contaminated uh, part like the spikes uh, will uh, not be a problem. We will get the mean and we will get a representative uh, uh, value for that specific iteration. And if we don't do that, we will have the spikes and it will bias the data. So we want to apply the rejection and remove that. Uh, if the contamination is a lot, and then if we are uh, actually losing the entire block, then uh, it is important that we have multiple iterations of the same subject, and then we have uh, more subjects so that we have enough data. And then in the statistical analysis, if you uh, apply uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, versions of uh, like uh, linear mixed models that uh, do not require equal number of samples from each compared group, for example, can take care of such um, unbalanced data. So I hope um, this helps. But there are also uh, tools, uh, methods to fix uh, missing uh, values, such as using the group average and other methods if you want to apply parametric and other methods like ANOVA. Okay. No, that's great. And, and perhaps this is another question in line with this on FNIRSoft, but Caroline has asked, does it, does it matter the order in which you apply low pass and, and the um, SMAR filter that you demonstrated? Uh, and mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so uh, again, depends on the contamination, uh, but um, I would uh, say um, uh, you can uh, um, apply the low pass filter and then uh, uh, the uh, SMAR uh, for um, um, a more liberal analysis. Okay. Um, all right, I'm just going to ask one more final simple question. We've had a ton of stuff come in, guys, but uh, we're going to get to answering all this as part of the Q&A report. So just um, so what is, a couple of people have asked about uh, maintenance uh, of the equipment. So uh, let's break this into two parts. So that we talked about, um, obviously, the FNIR device. What is the standard kind of cleaning and maintenance of that equipment um, going from subject, subject to subject? Mm -hmm. And then also, Fraser, I'd like you to comment on anything particular for um, the, uh, like the EDA sensors or anything like that that yeah. you demonstrated today. Um, so the FNIR guys, you go first. Um, sure. Uh, just to say, the maintenance is simple. You just uh, clean the surface of the sensor pad with an alcohol uh, wipe or like an uh, uh, some uh, kind of uh, antiseptic, just to 
uh, clean um, uh, any kind of uh, you know uh, dirt or anything from the surface of the sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no other special uh, you know concern. So we also want to make sure that we clean the skin of the participant as well. Especially this is important for uh, like uh, special uh, you know uh, chemicals like fondotan makeup mm -hmm. is present that would um, actually affect the measurements. Uh, it will. Um, uh, lower the SNR, so we want to uh, clean that before uh, data collection as well. That's a good tip. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and bef uh, the, before each use, please just to clean up the sensor path. Mm -hmm. uh, and second, I strongly suggest. I mean, I keep saying this to every time I talk to the our <laughs> operators. Please, please keep the sensor path straight, like on a straight surface, uh, surface after the use. Like they are so because they are so flexible. But mm. please keep in mind that there is an electronics surface mount system in there. So just to keep it very uh, straight and on a like a uh, on a, a concrete or on a uh, how do you say it? Uh, a flat surface. Very, yeah, just yeah, so that it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Lay it, lay it flat. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Lay flat. <laughs> That's critical because I saw a couple of times, you know, they just bend it over and keep it like that, and it's it it, it will help. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great, great feedback. Exactly. Uh, Fraser, um, how about you um, uh, for the uh, physiological measurement systems? Yeah, I was just going to add on to a little bit about oh, sure. the FNIS, uh, the, mm -hmm. the latest system ship with multi sensor arrays now as well. Um, and the point that was just made about making sure the sensors are kept flat, that's sort of critical really, that the connection point is at the end of the sensor array. So it's only the array that has to be um, packed away safely. And if you've got a piece of card or something like that, you just you know place it on top of that mm -hmm. um, for safekeeping. In terms of the physiological stuff, it's really pretty straightforward. We recommend the use of disposable electrodes both for EDA and for ECG. Um, preparation for EDA, just add a little bit of a dab of gel on the disposable electrode, not a lot, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Place the electrode. You don't have to use alcohol. You don't have to abrade the skin. You should not do that for EDA. Maybe just wash the hands before, um, not even with soap, just with um, tepid water, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. dry them thoroughly. And then for ECG, we do recommend abrading the skin just to make sure that when you apply the electrode, you're getting good skin contact. We also recommend the use of an impedance checker. Okay. Um, so you can just check impedance levels before. Um, but other than that, it's really low maintenance peel and stick and th throw the electrodes away after the use.